I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes and chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. That's right in the Bible, right after Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes 5, and I'm going to start reading at verse 1 down through verse 7. Solomon writes, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better, better is it that thou shouldest not vow then thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. I'm going to stop reading there. In, uh, excuse me, in our text, Solomon writes in verse 7 that in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities. He said back in Proverbs 10, verse 19, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. There's no shortage of sin. But whoso, but he that um, refraineth his lips is wise. There's an old expression, better to be uh, silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. Um, but Proverbs 10, 19 was a verse that the great John Wesley lived by. To avoid a conversation from, from turning into gossip, he would just stop talking to you after five minutes and walk away from you. Conversation's over. And at the end of last year, I preached on resolutions for every year. That was my last sermon of the last year. And we talked about how disciplined and regimented John Wesley was in his life. To be a good disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ requires discipline, hence the name, hence the word. And I recommended five things in that sermon which, if followed, will bring you closer to God and give you a deeper uh, walk in a relationship with God like never before. And they weren't that complex or complicated. I'll run through them real quickly. First of all, try to be in church every time the services are held. God has made you in such a way that you need to be with other Christians. They need to be with you. If I came here and none of you showed up, I would feel very lonesome. If you show, came and I didn't show up, you'd wonder what's going on. But I appreciate you being here, and hopefully you appreciate me being here. But we need to be with one another. We draw strength from one another. We encourage each other. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, verse 2. You can't do that if you're unwilling to be with other Christians. Uh, secondly, I said, read your Bible Every day. Try to read it through from cover to cover in the next year. A little bit at a time, if three chapters every day, maybe five chapters once a week on Sunday, and you can go through the entire Bible in exactly one year. There are a few little Bible reading guides uh, still left on the rack as you exit, and uh, it gives the daily readings uh, in a chronological order so you have an idea of how the storyline progressed and uh, where each book of the Bible was written at different on the timeline. And uh, I use that. I try to read a couple of those uh, assignments every day. And uh, 
keep a flow of how the Bible, the story of the Bible and the events of the Bible uh, unfolded. But however you do it, you need to do it. Thirdly, I said, pray every day. Talk to God every day. Say, oh, Lord, I, Pastor, I'm not used to talking to God that much. I'm not used to praying that much. And I suggested set the timer on your cell phone or anything else you have a timer on. Set it for five minutes. Just start with five minutes. And then you begin to talk to God about whatever comes to your mind. Thank him for the blessings you have. Uh, apologize and repent of anything you've done in the day before that was unpleasing to God, that was less than a Christian ought to do. Uh, and you'll be surprised how fast the five minutes goes off, the five-minute timer. So set it for 10 minutes the next day, 15 minutes. And the more you are in the habit of talking to God, confessing your sins, praying for your loved ones, praying for every need that you have, praying for other brothers and sisters at church, I know that you've been praying for me. I pray for some of you, too, when I know you have a specific need. That is also how you bear one another's burdens. And then fourthly, I said, try to witness to somebody about Jesus Christ in the next year. If every Christian here could just bring one person to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our numbers would double by next year. And all in you know, practice, although we, you might see someone get saved and they never come to your church. They never want to be part of your local assembly, your local congregation. That's between them and God. But try to win somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think point number five, I said, if you still have free time left, try to make better use of it. Stop watching so much television. Stop watching YouTube videos all day long and kitty cat videos and all kinds of other garbage. Stop watching that all the time. And uh, learn a musical instrument. If you had a musical talent years ago, develop it once again. Use it for God or something, some hobby, some pastime that you can use in the service of Jesus Christ. All of those things, they're not that complex. They're not that difficult and complicated to comprehend. And, uh, but if you do them, they will bring you into a much deeper life with Jesus Christ uh, like never before. And I want to believe that everyone who was here and heard that sermon agreed in your heart that, yes, I agree with all of that. I, I want to do those things. I believe I should do those things. I'm going to do those things. And then two weeks ago, we had our annual revival, our KJV Jubilee. We had some good sermons preached by our guests, Brother Steve Kogel and Brother Joshua Stevenson. We had some great music, great special music. We have a lot of musical uh, talent among our church members. And uh, we had some good food. That's always a big part of a, any revival, right? <laughs> and we had some good fellowship. And we had some great response to our altar calls, our, a great response to our invitations. And I want to believe in my heart that every decision people made to be more yielded, to be more consecrated to God in this new year, they meant. I want to believe that. And so today, let me ask. It's still a brand new year. So why have you failed already? Why have you failed already? It's terrible when someone promises you something and then they don't deliver. They don't keep their word. It makes you think less of them, and you wonder if you can trust them in the future with anything else. Look up there, or look rather at verse 4 in this text of the Bible. He says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. Don't put it off. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. In the middle of verse 1, he says, be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. And verse 3 says, um, A fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Fools make great big promises to God. They promise to do all kinds of great things to God, make promises when they pray. Sometimes they speak about what they're going to do just to get the attention of other people, to impress you, to impress someone who hears about it. And uh, they want others to be 
um, in awe of them and their consecration. But they don't keep their word. They never do what they say they're going to do. They fail not only God, but they fail the brethren. And God says that kind of person is a fool. You don't want to be like them. You don't want to be that kind of person. So you made new promises. You made new resolutions to God. You're going to pray more. You're going to read your Bible systematically, little by little, work your way through. You're going to try to witness for God in some way. And you've already failed. I thought about preaching this last week. And it would have been appropriate then. So let me offer you three principal reasons why you've failed already. Why you failed. Now, listen. Don't be discouraged. I'm not a long preacher. Um, I'm not the kind that wants to beat you for 45, 50, 55 minutes, 60 minutes with one sermon. I, I guess I'm just... You know, they say work smarter, not harder. Well, I'd rather just say what I think needs to be said. Get to the point and see if God can use it. No, plus it saves my voice. So let me offer you three reasons why you failed already. Number one, you overestimated the power of your will. You thought it would be easy. Those steps Pastor Schreib mentioned make sense. I think I can do it. I want to do it. I'm going to set my alarm uh, clock early and get up, and I'm going to finally do it. But you stayed up too late, New Year's Eve. You thought the New Year wouldn't come unless you were there to witness it, right? And by the time you did wake up, other people were already awake, so there's no more time for solitude, no more quiet time available. Somebody was in the kitchen cooking. Someone turned the TV on to watch the Rose Parade. Why anyone would be interested in that, I have no idea. But, so, you missed the chance to be alone with God but from the very beginning of the year. And instinctively, you told yourself, I failed today, tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm going to get started. I just read twice as many verses in my Bible, and then I'm, I'm on, back on track once again. But the next day, you had to go back to work. And you found out you have less time today than you had the day before. So here we are three weeks into a new year. And spiritually, you're the biggest loser. You wanted to do the right thing. You know you should do the right thing. Your spiritual strength depends upon you doing those things ultimately. And now that I've brought it up this morning... Some of you already are asking yourself, how in the world did I fail so quickly? How did I fail so easily? What's wrong with me? Take heart. The greatest Christian who ever lived struggled with the same problems. He struggled with the same conflict within. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 7 verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. I don't approve of it. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate... That do I. I can't seem to do the right thing when I want to. I do the wrong thing. And then also Romans 7 verse 19, he says, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. Willpower alone is not enough to bring you closer to God and give you the kind of uh, intimacy with God that you desire. It's not enough. Other things must be taken into consideration. Uh, which brings me to my second point. Not only did you overestimate the power of your will, secondly, you underestimated the power of sin. And when I say sin, I mean your flesh, the temptations around you, and the devil himself. You under underestimated the power of sin and all of its uh, facets. When the Lord Jesus went out to the Garden of Gethsemane with the disciples to pray, he said uh, in Matthew 26, verse 38, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And then he went a little bit further uh, by himself to pray to the Heavenly Father. And after that, we read in Matthew 26, verses 40 and 41, And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What? 
Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see that contrast there between the spirit, the desires of the spirit, and the weakness of the flesh? And the flesh is, what I say, is connected with sin and temptation around you. Part of you wants to serve God. Part of you wants to uh, get closer to God. Another part of you wants to go in the opposite direction. That's because there are two natures inside every Christian, and they're con at conflict. They're at war with each other all the time, fighting for dominance. The old nature wants to, to feel good and satisfy itself. The new nature wants to please God and do what's right and to be, get close to God. And, you know, the world understands this. The world understands generally the two natures within every man. Unsaved people understand this. You've seen the little cartoons where there's a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder, and they're both whispering in your ear telling you, do this, no, do that. And uh, you've seen that the Confucian symbol with the, the yin and the yang, one's a white half with a little bit of black in it, the other half is black with a little bit of white in it. And that's to convey the idea that even the, a good person can do bad sometimes. And a bad person can do good sometimes. And the Buddhist idea is to try to strike a perfect balance between the two. Don't go extreme in one direction or the other. Every time you criticize somebody, try giving a compliment to the next person. That way your heart is back in starting point and you're, you're balanced once again. And I've told you why that's a stupid idea. If you told your wife you only love her half of the time, would she be happy? If you only, if you only tell the truth, half of the time. Would people consider you an honest person? No. Uh, a better approach would be to go find the first person you offended and apologize to them, try to make it right with them. Don't say, well, I'll be nice to the next guy and they'll be okay. I'll be in the clear. No, you've left one person offended. Go find them. Bible, the Lord Jesus said, be reconciled to your brother. And so, but they, they forget that there's a third part of you. There's a third part of you that has to decide which direction to go in, which decision to make. That's the soul. That's the real you. And they forget about that third part of you, which is the real you on the inside, weighing these two options, deciding what I'm going to do between one and the other. And the Apostle Paul described this, this conflict within. He said, but I see another law in my members, my body, Warring against the law of my mind, the, the, the things I know I should do, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Or in Romans 7, verses 23 and 24. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, undoubtedly the trouble is with you. You can't look at someone else and say, well, they're the cause of my failure. No, you're the cause of your failure. Own up to it. You live in a crazy day and age where everything bad is someone else's fault. If I don't get the job, it's because there was some conspiracy against me. If I don't get that loan at the bank, there was some conspiracy against me. You know, by the way, I wanted to go into uh, some of the Korean restaurants and when they hand me a fork, say, that's racial profiling. You know, what do you mean? <laughs> I can use chopsticks too. See if I can get a lawsuit, you know. Larry H. Parker, they'll fight for you. But um, Bob Jones Sr. said, you know, so, so if I don't get that job, I don't get that promotion, I don't get that loan, I don't receive what I think I should receive, there's someone else to blame. But if something good happens to me, oh, yeah, I did it. I'm responsible. I, I can take credit for it. I'm proud of what I did. It doesn't always work that way, that cut and dry the Apostle John describes the, the nature of all the attractions and the distractions around you in this world. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. He writes in verse 15, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That, that little word, two letters, of, that little word of can go in two different directions. He's not talking about God's uh, love of you. He's talking about your love of God. The love of the Father is not in him. You can't love the things of the world and the things of God equally alike. You can't do it. And the Apostle James goes even further. He says in James 4, verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Who wants to be the enemy of God? What Christian wants to be the enemy of God? I don't. I don't think you do. But you failed in your spiritual resolutions because your flesh was weak. And uh, the world around you is very enticing. You know, on a cold morning, boy, those warm covers, they, those warm blankets, they feel pretty good. You don't want to get out of bed to read your Bible, take time to pray. You don't want to do those things. Um, it's amazing how the modern world uh, pampers us and makes us feel so good. And uh, we think, man, there's nothing I can't do. Yet the things you want to do, you don't do it. You won't do it. Long ago in the 1830s, 1840s, George Mueller, excuse me, George Mueller ran an orphanage in London, England. And he had at one time 700 uh, orphans and widowed uh, women under his charge that he would provide for every day. Don't you think with that many people depending on him to feed them and to take care of them that he had a lot of responsibilities every day? And yet He had no central air conditioning, no central heating, no electric blankets. He had no alarm clock with a snooze button. You know, he kept hitting. And he had none of the things that we take for granted in the modern world. And yet he wrote in his diaries things like this. I spent two hours in prayer and reading the scriptures this morning. I spent two and a half hours in prayer before breakfast, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. If giving God one-tenth of everything you have um, applies to finances, why not everything else in life? If you got, gave God 10% of everything you have, a tithe, that means you go owe God two hours and 40 minutes every day of your time. I realize people don't have that much free time anymore. They've allowed too many other distractions. But could you... Give God half of that time? Could you give God a third of that time in prayer, reading his word? Um, and yet, um, you and I find it too hard to get up 45 minutes earlier to read the Bible and spend time talking to God in prayer. Because, why, the, the, the floor is too cold when I step on it after I get out of bed? I have a little routine. I have my alarm clock set for 3.45 every morning. I try my best to get up when it goes off. Every day. I have the coffee maker set for 3.30. So it's, the coffee's all ready when I wake up. I know a lot of people use those Keurig machines. We have one, but we don't use it much. Because, and I'll tell you why, I don't want to, I wouldn't use it. First of all, I don't like the taste of the Keurig coffee. It doesn't taste like fresh brewed coffee, not to me. Um, and I mean, I deserve the best, right? <laughs> and, but secondly, I don't like that little sound. It, you know, 
That's not the sound I want to hear first thing in the morning. I don't want to hear that sound. So I'd rather have the coffee all already made while I'm still sleeping, ready when I wake up. And I have time all by myself to sit at the table, read my Bible, talk to God. And do a few other things before I need to leave the house, go to work. You know, after Jesus had fasted and prayed for 40 days, Satan decided to strike. He decided to hit him, tempt him while he was at his weakest point. If Satan wouldn't hesitate to tempt the Son of God, let me tell you, he won't hesitate to tempt you. He won't hesitate to try to uh, distract you and get, you, get your mind off of spiritual things, off of the Word of God, off of prayer, off of witnessing for Jesus Christ in some way, and get you to stop going to church, get you to stop doing any number of things. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it distracts your attention from God, he's accomplished it. He's, he's uh, achieved a victory over you. And we used to preach against television, saying, you know, waste, you waste so much time on television. And we preached against it hard when we only had about three or four major networks. And television has been replaced by the internet and YouTube. And now there are millions of websites you can go to. I mean, learning about UFOs and Bigfoot, that's, you know, interesting, but, but don't get distracted with that kind of stuff uh, and ignore the things of God. And uh, to give you any excuse not to pray, not to read the Bible, not to confess your sins, not to think about unsaved people. If Satan can just get your mind off of those things, he's achieved a great victory in you. So not only have you failed because you overestimated the power of your will, you failed because you underestimated the power of the world, the flesh, and the devil. You've underestimated the power of sin. Thirdly, and this is important, you failed because you don't love God as much as you think you do. The Apostle Paul describes some people, 2 Timothy 3, verse 4, verse 4, he calls them traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You say, well, Pastor Shrive, that's not very nice. Why do you say that to us? I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. When a young man is falling in love with a girl, or she's falling in love with a boy, you can't keep them apart. You can't separate them. I mean, every chance they get to be together because of the attention the other person gives them. She likes to hear his voice. He likes to smell her perfume. They want to hold hands. And uh, when my wife and I were beginning to see each other and date each other. We Trust me, I don't feel like I'm that old yet, but I've been married since before the internet. When you say it that way, it sounds like ancient history. I was married before cell phones. I was married before flip phones. Um, when I was a teenager, they had cellular phones, but they were these big, case, big cases. We're over here at a restaurant over on Vineyard Avenue. And there was one guy, he had one sitting on his table. And uh, I think only doctors and attorneys needed cell phones. And the third graders don't need a $300 iPhone. Why in the world? But so, it, you know, I'd send a card to her. She'd send me a card or something. Now it's just love text, right? Everything's emojis and hearts and the little uh, emoji with a kiss, you know. And it, she sends them to me. And I, I'm confessing myself. I reluctantly send it back to her too. But, but as a man, as a man, I don't like. I don't like. As a man, I don't like using that particular symbol. I don't know. And, uh, but when they're falling in love with each other, they can't wait for the day that they're married. And they get to be together forever. You can finally be intimate and live happily ever after. But before that time, somehow they find the, the drive, they find the strength, they find the energy to spend hours and hours with each other. 
They find the energy to stay out late, even when they have to work the next day. They find the energy to stay up late, talking to each other on the phone. Uh, but that's because that's part of being in love with somebody, falling in love with someone. When you first got saved, you were excited. You loved learning the Bible. You knew uh, you were happy to spend time in prayer. You knew that everyone should be saved. And, and you looked forward to going to church and being with other Christians when the, when the chance was there. And now the suggestion that you should try to return to those days and regain that joy, regain that happiness, sounds like too much to ask for a lot of Christians. But as the bride of Jesus Christ, the body of all true believers uh, collectively, you and I are waiting to be married to our bridegroom. Paul told the Corinthian church, for I have espoused you to one husband, you're engaged, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. At the rapture of the saints, you and I will become joined to our Savior, uh, our wedding day, as it were, uh, because we will then have glorified, uh, immortal, supernatural, resurrected bodies, just like his resurrected body. And then our wedding reception will begin. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7, 8, and 9. We should be as eager to, to and excited to spend time with God every day. Just like two young people in love. You know, some young man, he works in a big office, and there's a girl that's attracted his attention. She's like seven desks from his desk. She doesn't hardly know he's alive, but he sees her, and he, he thinks she's pretty. He's, he's, I wish I could get to know her. And just to be in the same room with the person you love, means a lot. It's comforting to know that the person you love is in proximity to you. They're, they're across the room. They're in the same building. They're in the next room over there. Just to know that they're close by is a very comforting feeling. And when he goes to work one day and she doesn't show up because she's out, she called in sick or something, something in his heart sinks. He's looking forward just to being in the same presence with her. That's how much it means to him. And that's how much it should mean to you as a Christian to love Jesus Christ and want to be with him, to be like him, be closer to him. When you pray, it's your chance to talk to God. But when you read his book, it's his chance to talk to you. It's a two-way conversation. And you might ask, Pastor, how can I make these things right? How can I start over again? Well, they say if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. When I was a little boy and my, uh, my sister and brother and I, we'd fall down, scrape our knee, we'd fall off of our bicycle. My mom and dad would say, pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and start all over again. The Bible says, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief, Proverbs 24, verse 16. A real believer, a real saint of God, will keep trying and trying and trying. Practice makes perfect, they say. The Bible says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy uh, to help er, er, and grace to find help, er, grace to help rather in time of need. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. I want to bring this to a close. And I want to have an invitation today. If anyone here today is saying, you know, Pastor Shrive, I fail already. But I don't want to fail. I don't want to go down as a failure in 2019. And if the musicians want to come, we're going to have an invitation. If some of you want to come, pray for a minute. Say, that applies to me. I'm ashamed to admit it. I'm embarrassed to admit it. that applies to me. 
You come and make things right all over again. We start again. The Bible says a just man falleth seven times and riseth again. You want to show that you're right with God. Your heart is right with God. Your consecration is right with Your dedication is right with God by simply starting over. 